I'm here with Chicago Blackhawks Insider Podcast with Blackhawks winger Colin Blackwell. Colin, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. You were drafted back in 2011 by the San Jose Sharks, but opted to go to Harvard. What was the decision in making that uh, that choice? Uh, I mean, I don't think I was ready to maybe make the step to professional hockey at that time, for sure. Um, and I remember going through the college recruiting process. Uh, there was a bunch of maybe schools in the mix, and I remember Ted Donato said to me, you know, if uh, he ended up almost jinxing me, um, but uh, if you break your leg and you can't play hockey, um, what kind of diploma do you want? Do you want, uh, you know, somewhere uh, across the river like BU or do you want a Harvard degree? And I think that was what kind of sold me um, and uh, ended up working out. And I, I thought uh, at that time they had a, a lot of good uh, freshmen coming in on that class and for the next couple of years. And uh, yeah, it was just exciting to, to play close to home and play in the bean pot was something that was big for me. Unfortunately, you suffered a pretty severe concussion uh, during your junior year, which took you into your senior year. Um, how was that experience in, in, in fighting and trying to get back to the, to the point where you were and knowing that you wanted to play professional hockey or you wanted to have that opportunity? How did that all go? Yeah, I mean, I think it's helped me from the looking you know, fast forward to this past year, taking 10 months off. Um, I've been through it. I missed 18 months of hockey. It was, I got two back to back my sophomore year and I missed 50% of my sophomore year, my whole junior year, and then 28 out of the first 30 games of my uh, senior year. And that allowed me to get that extra year of eligibility. Um, but ultimately, you know, for the first six months, uh, I was just trying to, you know, get back to playing hockey. And then after six months, I realized, you know, uh, there's a lot more to life than just hockey. And I was just trying to feel better and feel like myself again. And I ended up withdrawing from school for a year to just try to focus on my health. I wasn't playing hockey. I was struggling in school, even not really going to class. Um, and then being a 21 year old college student socially, I just wasn't able to really go out and be in social situations without, you know, getting headaches and just feeling dizzy and nauseous. And, you know, I'd walk to class and, you know, a city environment and kind of, you know, get really nauseous and just wasn't able to be a normal human being. So for a little while, I was just trying to get back to that, uh, you know, normal lifestyle. And then once I finally got back and I was comfortable uh, skating and everything, I, you know, six months of um, just, you know, feeling like myself and then skating some more, I was able to, to get back and, you know, ultimately play well and play enough to, to make it to the next so level. So you were, you were a redshirted senior? Yeah, technically, you took yeah. that whole year off. Yep, yeah. But was there ever a point where you said, I'm done, I can't do this, and walk away from hockey? Oh, yeah, a bunch of times. I remember probably six months in, right before I withdrew from school, I started uh, kind of turning the page of, you know, looking at maybe some of the interests that I had of what I wanted to do life after hockey. Um, and then I started applying to a bunch of different internships, um, doing a bunch of interviews, um, just seeing, I was like, maybe I can take this time, uh, hopefully to, you know, get healthy and start feeling better, but also take this time to maybe, um, get some work life experience, uh, outside of hockey to, um, see what I want to do in the future. Um, but, uh, I remember doing, going through some interviews and some stuff, uh, didn't end up working out and health wise still wasn't quite a hundred percent, but, uh, there's definitely some times where I wasn't even thinking about hockey. I was really just thinking about, um, honestly, uh, what kind of internship or what kind of job I wanted to do and what kind of avenue I wanted to go. And then, uh, like I said, just like trying to get through day by day of uh, getting rid of some of the headaches and some of the stuff that comes along with the uh, post-concussion syndrome. Wow. Um, if I'm correct, you majored in government and a minor in psychology. Yep. What were you looking forward to do if hockey didn't pan out? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I started, uh, did half my time uh, economics and political science there and then like you said psychology and I honestly was looking at um, now it's a little bit different but um, I, I wanted to maybe go into the FBI I had some um, you know coaches growing up that were FBI agents and field agents and I just thought that that was a good transition to um, you know maybe the fast-paced life that I'm so used to and being a part of a team like in the hockey culture um, so I thought that was something that I, I would be pretty passionate about and spoke to a bunch of people um, did some interviews and stuff, um, and the original plan was, um, you know, maybe to get one or two years work experience before I actually applied, and I was going to play uh, in the AHL and the minors, and if it didn't work out, then maybe go that uh, that route, but um, I, I was happy uh, looking back that I ended up sticking with it and ended up where I am today. Well, we're glad you did. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so you come back, your injury, sports hernia surgery, 
uh, it took a long time for you to come back. And I know you, you leaned on your experience of, of going through, you know, missing some time and, and, and dealing with a, a significant injury. Um, how much did that help you this time compared to last time? Big time. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it was kind of one of those things I, um, looking back or even going into the Colorado game, sometimes it's good to not overthink things and just kind of get thrown into the mix. Um, but for me, um, sometimes you just got to rely on hockey sense. I know like in the past last year and maybe previous years, um, you can watch a lot of film, do a lot of things, um, but it's hard to replicate game-like scenarios when you're skating by yourself because the reality of it is I, I skated by myself for a little while and I got one practice with the guys and then went in, into a game. Um, so some of that stuff's really hard to replicate and you kind of have to just, you know, don't be, a, my biggest thing was don't be afraid to make a mistake out there. Um, obviously I missed a lot of time, but I think when you get into that mindset of, um, you know, might not want to hurt the team or something along those lines, you just don't really know how it's going to go. Um, that can kind of set you back. And for me, I just kind of wanted to be on my toes, uh, just play the game that I'm, you know, accustomed to playing, uh, for checking, um, and just do, um, some people look at weaknesses, but I was just look at my strengths and play to my strengths. Um, and that was kind of the mindset going in. Just if you make a mistake, you make a mistake. It's, it's not going to be the end of the world. And ultimately it gave me a little bit more confidence going into the second time around. If you look at that game, the game against Colorado, you made a serious impact in that game. Very physical. You, you delivered some huge hits right off the bat. Luke Richardson talked about their bench was chirping at you the whole time. You were getting under the skin. Uh, was that kind of the mindset going in there, just to have the energy and bring that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I miss uh, collectively between last year and this year about 50 plus games. Um, and so I've watched a lot of hockey, our hockey specifically over the you know last 10 months. And um, I saw maybe some stuff that maybe our team was lacking a little bit. And um, I think I saw a stat over the summer that um, there was a small list of guys that their number of hits went down exponentially from year to year. And I, I was one of them. And it's kind of embarrassing to, to be honest with you, because I always, um, you know, it depends on what building you're playing in, if you get credit for hits and stuff like that. Yeah. But I, I've always, uh, it's been my game and how I've gotten here. Um, so when I saw that st stat, it was definitely a red flag for me. And maybe um, I didn't play as physical as I normally had been in the past. And um, I also saw that maybe the team kind of needed it a little bit too. Yeah. So, um, but that's something that I, I take pride in. I love killing penalties and uh, my favorite thing in the world outside of maybe scoring is, uh, you know, getting under this, the other team's best player's skin. It's uh, fun to frustrate people and <laughs> piss some people off. So that's kind of been who I have been uh, as a player kind of my whole life. And um, I think uh, that was something that I was just like, that's that's my goal to, to do it. And, you know, the rest of the stuff, once I get some more games and practices and reps under my belt will will come. It, it seemed in that game like there was no favorites. She delivered a big hit on Nathan McKinnon, which drew a lot of attention, and not only in, in the game and from the Avs, but around the league because it was a good, clean hit against a guy that you know you don't see get hit very often. What were your thoughts after that uh, hit against McKinnon? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't really thinking necessarily. Um, I, I think, like I was saying earlier, you, you always – you want to be aggressive the second you give some of the best players in the world so much time and space yeah. um you know that's when they make plays and I, I think you know looking at it from as a penalty killer perspective um when guys are on the power play and they have you know a ton of time and space and, and they're able to get comfortable um that's when you know they start they might not score necessarily on that power play but they get more touches they get more feels they start feeling good about themselves as the game goes on so my thought process was you know they always have you know some of the best players uh, on the world on the defensive side of things and also uh nathan mckinnon and a couple other players and anytime you get a chance to you know lay the body on them um by the end of a 60 minute game it, it takes its toll on some people and uh like you said not everybody uh he's obviously I respect the, the heck out of him. Uh, he's best player in the world for a reason, but uh, you want to make it uh, harder on them uh, any chance you get. So you're from the Boston area. Red Sox, Patriots fan? Yep. Which one? Favorites? No? Uh, I would say, yeah, uh, Patriots fan for me, just because uh, growing up, obviously, it was pretty spoiled as a Boston sports fan. So you got to watch the Tom Brady oh, yeah. dynasty. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now that it's over, maybe the possibility of Bill Belichick moving on as head coach uh, of the Patriots. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, my boys group chat kind of blows up all the time <laughs> talking about this, but um, I, obviously I'm not a football expert, but uh, I think there needs to be a little bit of a shakeup, but you know, he's probably the best coach of all time. So I think 
you know, him him being at the helm, but maybe find a new general manager to make some, you know, player personnel decisions. But, um, you know, obviously we had a great 20 year run um, and, uh, you know, we're we're lucky to, to have Tom Brady. Uh, and then also I think it was, you know, what is it, seven Super Bowls or six Super Bowls. Um, and, and I think 50 percent. Uh, of the time that um, he started games for us, uh, we went to the AFC Championship. You know, there's um, so there's a lot of a lot of fun there, and um, I think from a Bill Belichick standpoint, uh, you know, he's done awesome for us. So whatever happens, uh, he'll go down as one of the best of all time. You ever thought of getting into management after the game of hockey? You're sounding like a general manager uh, analyzing all this. I would love to. I'd love to be on the uh, the other side of things. Uh, maybe when I'm done, but um, hopefully that uh, doesn't come for a little while. This past summer, you got married to your wife, Lauren. You got married in Vail. Yeah. How did that all take place? Um, so Lauren and her dad growing up, um, the way they bonded was going to national parks. Um, so big outdoor kind of hiking uh, uh, mountainous family. And um, so I think that's something that she always wanted was a, a mountain wedding. And so we talked about it. Um, never really been there. And it was just from doing research and stuff. Um, she found a, a beautiful venue and, and ended up uh, working out. It was kind of one of those things where it was going to be a destination wedding for either side of the family, no matter if it was in you know New England or in the Midwest here uh, in, in Wisconsin. Um, so we picked uh, a place um, and it ended up being beautiful. So, what was what was the venue called? Uh, it was Piney River Ranch. Was that up the hill, up the mountain? Yeah. And then like the yeah, uh, the so lake like, setting? Yeah. So it's like an hour. Uh, it's only a six mile road, but it's unpaved uh, up uh, the mountain. So yeah, you, you have, I've been there. yeah it's not so um, you, yeah, you have to get like kind of special transportation to go yeah. up there and yeah. it takes like an hour to, to only go a couple miles, but it's, you're going like, I think five miles an hour max and all the bumpiness and all the roads. So it was uh, a lot of people who had never, I'd never been there. So the first time was uh, definitely a rude awakening. The pictures must just be amazing. Oh yeah, there they came out beautiful. Are you a golfer? Uh, I love golf. I'm not the greatest, but yeah. Rumor has you took the the, uh, the wedding party up to uh, Beaver Creek for a round of golf. I did. I did. Yeah. So um, that was awesome. We had, I think, uh, 16 guys. We went up there and um, some people that weren't in the wedding and were in the wedding. And uh, it was an awesome day. It actually rained in the morning. So like nobody was there. Um, and once the rain died down, we basically had the whole course to ourselves. So it was uh, mountain golf. Uh, Made me feel a little bit better driving the ball a little <laughs> bit further. Um, I think my brother, uh, he had some bad luck, though. He hit the car path and maybe hit a car. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he did? Yeah, no, he definitely did. <laughs> you, you leave a car on the, on the windshield? Yeah, <laughs> they chased after us. <laughs> <laughs> the car was moving? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Were the, was the car faster than the golf cart? <laughs> oh, they caught up to us and uh, they let them know that uh, they might be giving them a call. <laughs> so you and Lauren are big dog lovers. And you had uh, Bex, who's your, your dog, uh, involved in, in, in the wedding ceremony itself. Uh, what kind of dog is Bex and how did that all kind of unfold? Yeah, so uh, she's a mini golden doodle. Um, and uh, Lauren was just doing research and we found out that... Um, in Colorado, you don't need an actual human witness to uh, sign the wedding certificate. So uh, we end up getting a uh, paw pad um, and some ink and Bex was uh, our witness for our uh, wedding certificate. So um, she'll go down uh, in history and we'll always have that. So it was something that uh, we just looked into, found out and you know she's with us uh, all the time and is a huge part of our family. So it, it, was, uh, uh, it was awesome. Last year, I think it was, you were involved in, a, in a, an adoption initiative and you, you brought a bunch of um, puppy labs, was it? Uh, golden yeah, Retrievers? Golden Retrievers, yeah. Uh, to the Fifth Third Arena. Um, how important is that in your life? I know, I know that you are, are a big supporter of, obviously, dogs along with your wife. Yeah, so um, Lauren, um, kind of in her spare time, she's obviously a huge dog lover, and uh, I can't take uh, the credit for that. It was definitely her idea, and uh, she's uh, always helped out and been involved in, in a few different things. And um, she connected with uh, DTR Animal Foundation, um, and it's, uh, it was an awesome cause. And, and just to, to be able to do that, obviously, she's a dog lover. And and, uh, you know, you can see some of the smile, uh, smiles on the guys' faces just uh, bringing the dogs to the rink. But obviously, we helped them uh, find new families uh, for, from the rescue shelter. And um, so, you know, Lauren, uh, she does a lot, of, a lot of that. And uh, I'm definitely proud of her.
anywhere for that. Is it true that Reese Johnson adopted one of the dogs? Uh, that is very true, yeah. So, one or two? Uh, one, but I think he has a few dogs, so I think um, just... Add he's got one. the big ranch yes, back yeah, up in Red Deer, you know. He's got lots exactly. of room for the dogs to, to run around there. Yep, yeah. And rumor has it you adopt some dogs, uh, um, um, foster them, yes. I guess is yeah, what you yeah. call it. And one was a great day, and how was that? <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. I. I told Lauren, because we live in a small apartment in Chicago, and I was like, maybe now is not the time to uh, foster a dog. Uh, there was a lot going on last year. And uh, and so I came home from a road trip uh, and I land, I got a couple of voicemails and I was like, oh boy, uh, what's going on? So <laughs> she's like, I didn't listen to you. Um, I, I fostered a dog and it's, uh, it's not uh, a small dog. It's uh, like 150 pound Great Dane. So I was like, oh no. So we get home and um, it had never been in stairs before. Um, and we were on a three story walk up. So every time we had to take it out to the to the bathroom, I had to pick it up and bring it up and down. <laughs> like 150 the pounds. Yeah, I know. Um, so there's some good stories there after uh, I found a new home. Um, <laughs> I was cleaning the the kitchen a week later, and uh, it was so big that the slobber was still on the top of the the refrigerator. So uh, we have some good stories just compared to our our little uh, mini golden doodle and the 100 plus down uh, pound Great Dane. So it was uh, it was a funny mix. You you went to a Chase Rice concert last summer. Are you a big country guy? Yeah, big country guy. Where'd that come from? Uh, so I was lucky when I uh, played in Nashville um, probably four or five years ago. Um, some of the guys were friends with Chase Rice, so um, through them kind of always kept in touch and hung out with him a couple times. So when I saw he was coming to Milwaukee, Chicago, um, and Lauren's a big fan of Chase Rice growing up too, so I always gave her a hard time. Uh, one of the first times she came to visit me in Nashville, um, I said uh, we're going to my friend's house. Um, and we pulled up to Chase's and I think she freaked out. Uh, <laughs> a little yeah. bit of a surprise. Yeah, a little bit of a surprise. So whenever, uh, you know, a lot of country concerts come to the Midwest in the summer and um, just to be able to hang out with some people that I hung out with in Nashville, it was, it was pretty cool. Now, Lauren is from Wisconsin, and you guys have a, a home just outside of Milwaukee. Is that where you're going to be permanently after you're, you're done playing? Yeah, obviously, I think so, um, but uh, still um, hopefully a little ways away. But as of right now, it's awesome. It's about, uh, we're 10 minutes outside of downtown Milwaukee and uh, 20 or so minutes from her family, and a lot of her extended family are close by too. So um, with her kind of being away from, from her family uh, for a couple of years, um, we were playing in New York on the East Coast and then Seattle and Toronto. And um, to have that kind of stability uh, in the summers, close to home, close to her family, uh, it is awesome. And, and we really enjoy that kind of slower slower change of pace in the Midwest compared to what I grew up in uh, on the East Coast. Um, so uh, looking forward to, uh, it's a beautiful area and yeah, we definitely, we love it there. I'm Troy Murray, Colin Blackwell. That's another edition of Blackhawks Insider Podcast. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.